Okay, so now we'll be slowly starting eh, um, with our last panel for the today. Uh, that has a title supporting uh, innovative uh, development of the culture and creative hubs. So like, uh, uh, my name is Luka Piškoric. I will be the moderator of uh, uh, this panel. Um, what can I say about myself? For the last 10 years, I have been uh, running a creative hub in uh, first Slovenian creative hub in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and very much active in developing creative hubs also in other countries. Um, what do we, uh, how do we define creative hubs? I think creative hubs are much more than just physical spaces where uh, people come to work together, to collaborate, to get uh, various opportunities for. Uh, new knowledge, uh, business opportunities, all sorts of support services, and so on and so on. Most of all, creative hubs and cultural hubs as well are creative and cultural communities. And by communities, we mean a group of people who share the same interests, also same, uh, many times same problems. And while working together, getting to know each other, they develop trust. And trust is one of the most important uh, um, things that enables people to actually start collaborating, sharing knowledge, and also uh, develop social capital, meaning that they can help each other when uh, somebody needs help and so on. And um, why actually we have started uh, working with Creative Hubs 10 years ago, it was in the aftermath of the economic crisis of 2008, 2010, when of course this whole sector went into crazy precarization and such spaces started uh, to be uh, recognized as important for mitigating these whole problems uh, around uh, the challenges that came from the, the, this economic crisis. Um, today I'm here with uh, super interesting panelists uh, that they all have uh, very comprehensive CVs. And for me, it is, uh, I would say it is very uh, ungrateful uh, task to kind of sum them up very shortly. So I will ask them to, to do it for themselves uh, in a very brief uh, kind of uh, form, but also to say what they are working on lately. I think this is something that is usually missing in these CVs and that we all want to know. Um, so maybe ladies first. Wafa um, Belgasem um, from the Culture Funding Watch Tunisia. I hope I said your name uh, right. So please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Greg Tormet, for the opportunity and inviting me to join this amazing crowd here. So I'm Wafa Bilgesem. I'm the founder of Culture Funding Watch. We're based in Tunisia, but we operate on matters relating to facilitating access to finance and resources for culture creatives uh, industries in Africa and MENA regions. Um, uh, what, we do that with different ways, including uh, capacity building, advocacy, matchmaking, and research. But um, when talking about creative hubs or creative networks, I would define the work we do on CFW as um, a web. The way we operate to fulfill our mission, we work in different dimension, advocacy research, but we use also different platforms that actually feed each other. So besides CFW, we have the CCIboost.com, which is the platform that it's a mix between LinkedIn adapted to cultural creative industries and matchmaking finance platform. So when you are on CCI Boost with your profile, you are visible to funders and investors who have their own profile and platform, but also you generate data and statistics open source to the community. So that's part of facilitating access to resource. We do that through other platform, which is the RMD, the resource mobilization, which is a pure online concept that brings together those who support the art and the creative sector with those who operate and then to share information about funding, investments, who's doing what. And the third and the last baby you're asking what we're working on is another platform called the Art and Stay. And it, in short, it's the Airbnb for art spaces. And that's also related to the resource mobilization because we build it with the perspective of maximization resources because when you have an art space, you have a lots of spaces that are under used so you can use art and stay to put them or maximize them for a community that it's larger than the art community because we know there is people looking for immersive experience people who are a friend of the art like me for example i am an operator i don't do residencies and i travel a lot and i'd rather 100 times 
sleep on the floor and give the money to an art space than be in a hotel, but I don't have time. I don't know where to go. So if I had a platform like Art and Stay, I would go easily and identify and book in such spaces. The most last thing important about the Art and Stay is that it's built on solidarity. So in booking websites like Booking, whatever, you the only exchange option is money. So you book, you pay. But on Art and Stay, because we know our community, we're not all rich and we don't have just money to exchange, you can opt for different exchange, like skills exchange for free, a donation to somebody else, and then you can uh, exchange. So that's my last baby. We just finished the platform. Thank you very much. Uh, joining us online uh, by Zoom is Alina Mada from the Lebanese Center of Policy Studies. Welcome. Can you hear us? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you can hear me well. Okay. Uh, my name is Lina Madah. I have a PhD in economics from Universidad Rubira Ebergili in Tarragona. Uh, I have worked in my PhD program on cultural and creative industries. Uh, my work was whether these industries have the capacity to generate employment growth at a local level uh, in Catalonia. And then I worked on the detection of geographical clustering of cultural and creative industries in the functional urban area of Barcelona. And we did some work also on whether these clusters have the capacity to attract creative firms to specific clusters. So this work was uh, co-authored with uh, my PhD supervisor back then, Professor Giuseppe Maria Arauzo Carod. Uh, so yes, also I have worked a little bit with the OECD on culture and local development in Venice, Italy. Uh, and then I came back to Lebanon and we are trying to pursue and to initiate an agenda for cultural and creative industries in, in back home in my country. So we are trying to start activities related to the mapping of creative industries, their clustering, uh, geographical clustering, and the potential of these clusters, especially um, during the times of unprecedented crisis that we have in the country at the moment. So yeah, this is it. Thank you. Much. Uh, at this point, I must excuse uh, Samir Yamani from the creative dialogue.net. Um, unfortunately, um, he couldn't join us today due to um, unforeseen uh, events. Uh, but uh, with us is also Mr. Theo Edmonds from the University of Colorado, uh, Colorado Denver. Please. It's good to be here with everyone today. Um, I'm Theo Edmonds, and I've played a lot of roles over a professional life. Uh, but here's things you should know about me. Um, I'm a culture futurist. That does not mean that I predict the future. What I do is I look at cultural trends that are happening to try to help us understand what intersections are happening that may not be connected to each other. And then how does human instinct, human experience play into identifying particular opportunities that might be at those intersections? I'll give you an example. One of the um, core human instincts that we have, Nurike and I were talking about this earlier, is that instinct to know the unknown. It's something from the first time one of us stood up and looked at the stars and said, I, I wonder what that's all about. That instinct to know the unknown is a powerful one. Well, in the 90s, when we were seeing organized religion in the US began to decline precipitously, at the same time, we saw the technology coming out of the academy and going into people's homes in a very profound way and spreading across and it becoming part of our everyday lives. So as those two things crossed in the 90s, that instinct to know the unknown might have been a prayer 50 years before, God, will my child who has this disease survives, becomes, hey, Google, well, my child who has this disease survives. So that instinct to know the unknown is a powerful one. And so that's an example of how cultural trends uh, that might cross provide opportunities. The other thing you should know about me is I'm from a nine generation Appalachian family. I grew up in rural America and Appalachia. I'm queer, I'm neurodiverse. And these are the things that inform how I make meaning in my world and my life. As we were listening to the last session, I wanna remind us something that language matters and correlation is not causation. 
in creativity research, there is absolutely no evidence that mental disease, mental disorders are linked to advanced creativity. That's not in the, in the data. So it shouldn't be as no surprise to anyone that if you are presented two options, do this or do this, and neither one of those make you feel alive in your, in your spirit, that you find new ways to address your life and make uh, a, a existence for yourself. You know, in, in the U.S., we have an incredible, incredible, long-going legacy of racism in our country. And so if you look at how black folks have been treated in the work environment, it should be no surprise to anyone that female black entrepreneurs are the fastest growing section of entrepreneurial uh, activity because they are creating worlds, they're creating businesses that are meaningful to them on their terms, not because it's connected to some kind of, kind of brain disorder. I'm sure that that exists, but I want us to be really careful of how we're using language and tying some of this stuff together. Um, the other thing that you should know about me is I have played corporate roles. I found corporate America to be very wanting. I've played roles in social innovation in the Southern United States. I found the system of philanthropy to be a lot of virtue signaling, quite frankly, of very rich people who are getting a tax write off and using uh, the problems of poor communities to lift themselves and their egos up. I, I'm generalizing a lot here. And I've played roles in the academy. I'm a research associate professor. And in that role as research associate professor at the R1 University, I, I was at before I'm where I'm at now, I was awarded the Trailblazer Award for research for work I was doing inside a National Science Foundation lab on measuring hope, trust, and belonging and what that could predict in terms of innovation and business. And we've since uh, expanded this work and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So these ideas, I loved what we were talking about earlier, the social context, the context in which something happens matters as much, if not, I would say maybe even more than what we might all bring to the table because it is the thing that shapes how we understand ourselves and how we understand our identity. And so as we go through this, I'm really excited to see how the cultural and creative industries in this region can lift up people on their own terms, the terms that are most meaningful for them in providing independence and freedom. Because here's what I will tell you as a well-being researcher and a creativity researcher, freedom, Freedom, self-determination is the single greatest multiplier of creativity and well-being that exist. They're powerful. And uh, Ram and I were talking yesterday. Economists will tell you that when freedoms expand, we see economies thrive, move up. When freedoms contract, we see the opposite things happen. So though we are talking about cultural and creative economies here today, I think we're also having a very important conversation about freedom. And in the world we're in today, that seems like the conversation that we need to be having. Yeah, and uh, Professor Salvador Simo, uh, you also have a presentation, so you're welcome. Hi, my name is Salvador Simo, and I also have different roles. I am teaching at two universities, in one in Vic. I am the adjunct director of the mental health chair, and I'm the other, uh, so I'm teaching about mental health and the inter interdependence of the social determinants of mental health, mostly. On my other universities, the European Business School, then I am teaching about entrepreneurship. So I'm linking both, both fields, the health, especially social issues, creativity, culture, and entrepreneurship. We are leading with a lot of different action research projects. So this is more or less what I can, I can share with you. And also I'm very inspired by the Brain Capital Alliance and EMEA. So I'm very happy to be here. My background is occupational therapist. Then I jumped into a master of business administration. I have a master also in social entrepreneurship, landscaper, my PhD is in education. So I am a mixed person, my background is mixed.
but when I feel so comfortable as now, but inspired by this place, I, I am sincere how I like to introduce myself to people. I, I really want them to know me. I consider myself a social artist. I am writer, I have published some books. I don't know how to do a sculpture or painting, but I do projects that try to have an impact in the social, cultural, environmental aspects. So I am a, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, this one, yes. Okay. So, uh, are just some slides I just prepared when I realized here that I can share some slides with you because you know life is about storytelling. So, I would love to, to share some a story with you that for me. It's meaningful. So when we talk about art and carta, culture, I think first of all, we need to, to remember that we are talking about human rights. It's not something, it's a privilege, it's something naive, it's not something else. It's a human right. Everybody has the right to access, to enjoy, to participate in the cultural, artistic, creative life of the community. And it's our responsibility from where we are as citizens of global citizens to ensure that everybody, North, East, West, whatever they are, they have access. But also if they have any kind of problem, physical, mental, social, whatever. So that's our responsibility as society. But you know, we have so many challenges. We could talk about climate change. We could talk about inequality. We could talk about war, so many. But let me just focus on one. Let's just think about, for example, dementia, Alzheimer. You know, they are familiar with you, these topics. Maybe some of your family members, my father had Alzheimer. I'm so sure that so many of your families, something close to you has, but you see, 2020, 50 millions of people with dementia in the world. 2030, it expected the World Health Organization predicts 80 millions. 2050, 150 millions. I was very good in philosophy, biology, not very good in maths, I am honest, but even though I was not very good in maths. So how we are gonna do it? Every time we have more and more necessities, because more people is affected with dementia, we, we need treatments, we need uh, pharmaceutical intervention, therapeutic intervention, and we have less budgets. I don't know in your country, Catalonia, Spain, we are dealing with crisis, economic crisis, whatever. So as David Bohm says, the problem is that we are repetitive when we really need to be innovative. And I think art and creativity are one of our biggest hopes today in this contemporary society. So my story starts here, but it's not true. It truly really started in 1994. I didn't want to tell you because then I say, oh, in 94, he was already in refugee camps in Bosnia working. So that must be all men, yes. 94, 95, 96, I was working at the refugee camps in Bosnia. 99, I was working in Kosovo, 96, I was working with Mayan communities in Guatemala. There I realized the power, amazing power of art and culture to create well-being and social participation for the communities. I was working, for example, in Kosovo with Medicines and Frontiers, working with war children to prevent mental health problems like post-traumatic stress disorder. We empower the amazing communities, the teachers, and we use the language of art and creativity plus play to ensure that we are promoting the resilience. They were preventing mental health trauma. They discovered the amazing greatness of the human spirit. I still don't believe that children that went three months under hell waiting their turn to die. It's not a poem. For three months, people were combating two net, two squares from here. After three months waiting to die with a, a small therapeutic intervention, intervention based on art and culture and play 
it was amazing how they were flourishing. So we learned about the amazing power of culture and art. So ladies and gentlemen, what you are doing is so, so important. So congrats for your work and please keep on doing. I strongly believe art and culture, art and culture, it's our biggest hope today in the contemporary world. But I go back, CCCB, I have a dream. Why not to ensure that even people with dementia Alzheimer, as my father, had the right, but also the opportunity to enjoy art? Why, instead of being repetitive, we listen David Bohm and we are creative and we say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, the center of contemporary culture, it costs millions, but it's there. What about if we add other value to this center? It's not just about art. It's not just about culture. It's not a lot of funky people of Barcelona going there. Why we don't ensure people with dementia goes there and we do research to realize if it is affecting health and social participation. So we did it. So this was the first part, the first chapter of the history. 15, 16, we're working with the CCCB in Barcelona. But in 2016, 17, we also start working with mental health survivors. We went to a work, action research again in the museum of Bellas Artes in Coruña, that's Galicia, it's in the north of Spain. But again, 17, 18, the ones who are Catalan, you know it, the Auditori Nacional with the National Orchestra. Instead of being in a boring and sad day center with people with dementia, listening to music, why not we go to the National Palace with the National Orchestra that perform for them. They enjoy the music. They listen to the National Orchestra performing. But after that, they even do music themselves with music therapies. So that was the third chapter of this histories. But we also went internationally. We have been working. We went to Canada to the Museum of Modern Art in Tbilisi. And also we went to Winnipeg Art Gallery in Canada to spread this kind of projects. And we realized that what I learned in Kosovo, language, art, and culture is the language of the human spirit. We can use in Tunisia, we can use in Canada, we can use in Catalonia, we can use wherever. So one of the last projects has been in the Museum of uh, Museo Tissa in Madrid. It's one of the best museums. Here again, we have been working with, with mental health survivors. So here I was supposed to share some thoughts with you. I think it's very important to develop creative hubs, all this more connected to industry, creative industries, to develop action research projects. So this is something I wanted to share with you. I think it's uh, important if you can develop not just amazing actions. I am an action man. I consider myself an entrepreneur. And I love Fitz, the philosopher who says, action is the most important. Action tells the world who you are. But also we need research because when we need to the policy makers to ask for funding, to ask for something, to have that research. So we have been doing research for all these years. And we have connected all these little hubs of research, the research done in the CCCB, with the National Auditorium, with the TC Museum, with Bellas Artes. This month I go to Serralves. We start in Serralves Foundation in Porto, for example. So this is very important. Action research. Our research focus on social transformation. Our research focus to ensure that everybody has right to art and culture we ensure this. So this is something very important. But what I also wanted to learn a second reflection with you. Of course, art and culture, the traditional creative industries are very clear. But remember, in 30 years, we will have triple the number of people with dementia. We'll move from 50 to 150 million. There is no health system in the world able to deal with that. Two weeks ago, I was near here in the Catalan government of health. They were saying, Salvador, we have a problem since COVID. We have invested so much money in pharmacology bills. The same amount we could have contracted 11,000 professionals. So at the national level in Catalonia of the health, they realized we cannot do that. So it means we need to do something different. So when we have done the research, we realized that it's not just that art and culture, what you do, 
create well-being and promote social participation, provoke a positive impact in caregivers and relatives, but also it's a possibility to create employment. So it's connected to cultural entrepreneurship because what we do is to train professionals to be able to use art and culture to empower the communities to ensure well-being and social participation. So when we go to all these institutions, we are creating new jobs. So it's a possibility that I really wanted to share with you about that importance of research, publication, creating evidence, whatever. But the, green, the dream grow. So we have been working one single institution with mental health survivors or people with dementia. Why not we do it at a city level? So from three years ago, we achieved that my city, it's a art and culture friendly city. All the institutions of art and culture are giving free services, free as all the other projects. Three projects for the people and their families. So we have connected three different museums, two orchestras, two historical sites in this project. So you see how it's not just creating hubs between the single institutions, is we have achieved that a city is a hub. And here it's another message. We need to work on the quadruple helix. We need to work with the civil society, with the public society, private, and of course, universities. I think this is a strong partnership. <laughs> but my last message, and really I'm here for this, I keep on dreaming. So the dream continues. So of course we are dealing now with the Catalan government because we want to escalate our project to a national level. But we are also working at POCTEFA because we have presented the project to do a cluster, hubs connected between Catalonia, Spain, because also SCADI, and Doran, France. But I am really here because when I met Rim, I had a new dream inspired with this from this lady. You know, my, I have a Mediterranean soul. I've been in 36 countries, I counted, working, ta, ta, ta. But at the end, I realized I am from Mediterranean. And I love humanity, I love Canada, but I am Mediterranean. So my dream now is to spread this project through Mediterranean. So maybe I can, we can do something together. That's my inspiration. Thanks to EMEA, of course, thanks to Create for Met, and inspired by Brain Capital Alliance, inspired by Theo, by Harris are from RIM. This is what they think now. These hubs, these clusters connect like the neurons. This is the inspired by the Brain Capital Alliance. How we can connect each other and we do synapses. We create wonderful things. We create beauty that as we said with RIM, it's important. So ladies and gentlemen, Elmer Kammer says, when one belief alone is a dream, when two or more believe together, it's the beginning of a beautiful reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salvador. Yes, we will continue with, uh, I think it's kind of important uh, question to ask you, what in your opinion from your experience, what you have kind of visited or seen is a creative or cultural hub, a community, that, in your opinion, has an important impact or does a very good job in supporting uh, and uh, uh, helping grow creative and cultural businesses, entrepreneurs. Can you maybe expose some kind of such case? I can, I can I expose uh, a trend I see over the African continent right now. Um, the creative hubs, in, in the form that we all understanding the classical one, like it has a physical or it has a clear program, are being now work growing in parallel with informal and unphysical other of hubs. Uh, with that, I think it's related to the development of technology and digital way of communicating and connecting. So I see a new trend over the continent which is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a virtual space where a huge networking and creative hubs 
are moving. Like African, we are on WhatsApp now. If you want to meet the creative people in Africa, you have to get yourself into those WhatsApp groups. And the information is fast. Things are sharing, partnership are built just on being in those groups. Um, so I think that's a trend that has to be watched. That is trend that support programs or our funding mechanism need to look at. We need to be innovative. Like I'm talking from my perspective and area of work at CFW, this is what we do. Like we look, we look in trying to match the financial support to what's going on on the field. And I think there is a gap now because you know how to support and finance this kind of operation and this kind of spaces of connecting, sharing and working together. Um, so uh, yeah, this 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 is one of I mean this is really new and and taken up. Um, another trend also is those network of we call them now it's trends like connectology. Everybody is talking about it right now. So that's also another space to to look at. And there, again, they don't have a physical space. There is not you cannot like for example I can talk of the MyPad, the most influential African of crib most influential creative of African descent. And this is a network that brings together all the African creatives from all the sectors, including diaspora. And we don't have a physical space, but there is like a group, there is a selection, there is a nomination every year. And then from there, partnerships are be built, help. Like it's really useful. Like I'm going there, uh, I wanted to connect with the ecosystem somewhere in, I don't know, I mean, in Spain, and I will look after the, my pageant in Spain, and then I get all everything I need. And, and I get this, we build, as you mentioned earlier, uh, building the trust, because because it's by nomination. So there is a trust. I know that the people who are in that network has been already be screened by peers, and you know, for reputation, ethics, and all those stuff. So it speeds the partnership and the action you're talking about process. So I don't waste a lot of time, not waste. It's, it's always important to know the person you're working with, but you will go faster because that screening and check has been done by the network. So you can, I honestly, like I'm so confident in those kind of things now. I've never had bad experience, so I must be lucky, but I really don't do that. Okay, that's nice what you're doing. I want to do this. That's, the next day we're doing something together. Um, so I think those are these two trends to be considered when you are mapping or where you are designing projects and um, uh, who to involve and how to involve. And most important, I'm talking to the donors here, how to support, because not we, we use, like I'm talking about the institutional support. Of course, there are many other ways to support, luckily. But for the institutional donor, there must be a reflection on how you work with non-physical uh, hubs or not. Just like that you would like to point out at this point uh, it's hard to recommend anything to institutionals but uh, i would say um if i take the eu for example um i would say maybe involving them from the design stage it's much easier to integrate them and the funding mechanism rather than working by calls and application because without physical and you know legal things it's very complicated to have public funding which makes sense you're welcome. So <clears throat> all, of my, all of my life, I've kind of um, looked for naturally occurring experiments because I think that we, we often focus on creating often things from scratch and there's a huge lift that's required. And so I try to kind of identify where things are already naturally happening that if a different frame was put on it, a new what if question was introduced that what could happen then? And so as I'm thinking about creative and cultural hubs, that naturally occurring experiment to me in America is the American workforce. And here's the reason why. The typical American will spend more of their waking life at work than any other place. Great resignation still continues. Toxic work culture is the number one reason that people are leaving their jobs in search of some are becoming entrepreneurs, some are leaving the workforce entirely. Others are moving from one company to the next, hoping for a better, better go at the next, next place. And so as you see that, <clears throat> kind of the mantra that I live by is that culture shapes business, 
artists shape culture and people shape change. So what if we empowered uh, scientists, not empowered artists, artists are already empowered. That's what I love about being an artist. Um, what if we empowered scientists to go beyond their discipline and rather than seeking the approval of their peers to engage with artists and business leaders, artists, business scientists in these triads of understanding with the science in hand, quantitative, I'm a quantitative data scientist. That's what I believe, that's what I do, cultural analytics. So if we were to be able to give quantitative data to artists to design better workplace experiences, what might be the impact on business from an innovation output, from a workplace well-being standpoint? And so the workplace then, the company becomes a naturally occurring creative and cultural hub because this is where most people are spending most of their time anyway. And in, in the United States, 80% of Americans get their paycheck from the private sector. And so while I know many artists may or may not be interested in engaging with the private sector, I am, because that is what is putting food on the table for most Americans, no matter where they're coming from. And so that feels like a naturally occurring experiment that is in need of a new vision. But here's the challenge I think that often happens. We, um, we have trained, uh, business leaders and the ent current entrepreneurial training model, at least in, in the U.S., is full of bravado, right? You appear confident, make sure that you just show no weakness. And so we, if we teach people, we teach entrepreneurs that they need to appear as if they've got it all figured out, they're completely ready to go, and they have no question about where they're going. Well, there's an opportunity cost to that. If all we're doing is looking for friction-free organizations, if all we're doing is teaching people how to put their strengths forward and hide everything else, we're missing the opportunity to manage through creative tensions, to manage through paradox, to manage through being human together. And so when I think about those kinds of opportunities, CERN in Switzerland, the Super Collider program, is doing something really fascinating that has completely got me kind of kind of thinking about what this looks like in a creative cultural hub as in in the in a company context. So, CERN is a, a Super Collider program replicating the laws of the universe uh, with quantum physics, astrophysics, quantum mechanics. They've been doing fascinating artist residencies for a decade or more. And here's what I find interesting about CERN. So you have some of the brightest minds on the planet who are understanding and deciphering the laws of the universe who say, we know that humans live out those laws of the universe because at the end of the day, we're all stardust. There's everything in this room, everything we call an economy, everything that we are comes only from two things. That which comes out of the earth and human imagination. Both of those things come from stardust. So we know that the laws of the universe and everything that we are so assured about as buildings and economies and nations here really come from that same place. And so because they know that, they are interested in what do spiritual Native Ameri spiritual traditions and Native Americans in the Southwest United States, what, do the, what is their spiritualism and the laws of quantum mechanics say about each other's ideas and they found them they, then they're doing a, a project right now in black quantum futurism with our, our black artists from the u.s who are engaged in social justice and community activity because they know that social justice is expressed in the laws of the universe but we don't spend time understanding those how those two things relate to each other we spend more time i think convincing everybody that our way of looking at the world is the way that everybody should be looking at the world right and so what i've noticed about cern that makes it work though is there is a deep humility with which these scientists approach these artists in the residencies they don't come in assuming that they have all the answers and the artists are there for pr value or there to do art in, you know in the place they're there to develop a shared language that neither one of them can develop on their own but they both have pieces for together and i think when we talk to think about 
opportunities for innovation, for redefining innovation, of how human imagination can express itself differently. I look at, at places like CERN and I say, that's a really interesting model. If we could replicate that with quantitative data, you know, all the tools, but in the work context, that feels to me like there's an incredible opportunity to understand creativity, not as a thing that defines a class and a creative industry and separates it from everything else, but then creativity in this context becomes the science of connection from business to the arts and to uh, other fields of science. And I, I find that to be completely fascinating. I think, yeah. Lina, to you, can you share with us maybe some of your observations? Yes, sure. So this is very interesting what I'm hearing from uh, the other panelists, but I would like to give some uh, technical, uh, some technical information based on a research study that we have conducted on the clusters, creative clusters in Barcelona. So um, we have found that CCIs tend to cluster. And of course, as uh, Apologies, I couldn't remember the name of the panelists, but as the discussion was going that creative industries and creative clusters specifically have the capacity to attract creative class, which includes other uh, professionals different from the creative professionals. So we have found that CCIs generally tend to cluster, especially in the core or urban areas, for example, in and around Barcelona city, the core. And we have found that there are structural differences at the industry level in terms of clustering. Like we always say CCIs as a whole, but in order to understand how these industries locate, interact and innovate, we try to look at these industries separately. Art and media related activities alone, uh, fashion design and manufacturing alone. So we try to separate between these industries in order to identify which policies can be effective in attracting specific firms to specific clusters and making these clusters innovative and capable of having a knowledge spillover, not only on creative firms, but also on the creative class and the society as a whole. So um, if you want later on, as we move forward, I can give some, some examples of uh, of this, but general policy recommendations, I think that policymakers need to consider the characteristics of clusters in terms of their size, in terms of their geographical scope, the number of firms, the number of employees, the number of locations and neighborhoods involved, and the life cycle of these industries. Some clusters have the capacity to survive for a long time, and we have seen that in Barcelona City, and some clusters do not have this power to survive over a long period of time. So policy measures need to differentiate between mature clusters and embryo clusters and to target specific policies to specific um, industries among CCIs, not to CCIs like as a whole. Yes, so thank you. Uh, maybe uh, Salvador, back to you. Can you maybe point out some very good example of such creative or cultural hub on this kind of missions or something that you imagine could be fulfilling this mission. Do you mean connecting the art uh, yes. with the health? Well, as I said, we are growing and we started with one single institution. After two or three years, we have already connected five different institutions and then we escalate from one single institution to a city level institution. And now we try to replicate it through the strategy we are using, especially we are using the European projects. For example, we have this POCTEFA that's with Andorra, but there is a new one that will allow us to try to connect other parts of Europe. And as I mentioned you, uh, through EMEA, we try to spread through the Mediterranean. And thanks to Theo also, we dream also to have uh, Trans uh, transatlantic dream connecting with the University of Denver in of Colorado in Denver. The, so uh, this is the 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 the, clear, the 
more proximal example. Uh, so it's a discovering path because it's not a model we saw, it's a model we are creating all together. And what I have learned that I think is very important is that we need, you need everybody on the table. For example, the, to be able to build a hub at the city level means that everybody is seated on that table. It's very important, the participation, starting from the people with dementia. And I will give you one example. I am from academia, and when we talk about research, we normally do not include the people with dementia, but the research itself says that the people with dementia in the first stage can answer to interviews, and they want to speak in first person. So what I think uh, it's very important is just to ensure that everybody is seated, starting for the protagonists, the people with mental health problems, with health problems, the business people that Theo was saying, this is very important. And to ensure that all the people from the social sector, from the cultural sector, from the health sector are there. And especially it's very important also what you are saying uh, to work with the political sector. And we are also escalating. We started with from the city village. Now we are talking with the national governments. So we're also escalating. And again, I, I am very, uh, um, I am also with the same opinion that Theo, normally when we work in the cultural sector, in the health sector in Spain, we don't like to talk about business and we need big business on board also. As he was, he was saying that it's where people is, but also it's amazing when you have the people from business. So the only thing, uh, look, I can say that you need this quadruple, quadruple helix and everybody needs to be there. But my further message is everybody also includes the citizens, but when you think about culture and art, think also with citizens with dementia, think with also with citizens with mental health problems, think especially, for example, uh, we are using art for teenagers. In Spain, we have a big problem with the mental health status of the teenagers, and we normally forget about them, and they are the ones who must be the next, they're already citizens, but they are gonna be the protagonists of our democracies in the, in the next years. And for example, we're using rap. We are working with artists, with rap singers, with people from hip hop, and then the artists are teaching the teens with mental health problems or from neighborhoods, the private neighborhoods, how they can use hip hop or rap to express their emotions. So, so my what I want to highlight in this point is the importance to to be really inclusive. Because at least in Catalonia, in Spain, our tradition has been that Alta and Carta were for naive people, from funky people, people wealth with wealth. And again, it's a human right that must be for everybody. This is what we have learned. Wafa, if, if we focus on MENA region, who are the people missing at the table? And uh, what are the challenges and opportunities if we get the right people to the table? Who do we have to invite? How can we sit at the table, like from the other side of the Mediterranean? What can we bring to the table? What, what can be our contribution? The people missing back from the perspective of the community or the creative hubs? From the perspective of a uh, community, okay. but also, yeah. That's, I mean, I, this is, I'm bringing something that both touches to the state of uh, a proliferation, let's say, of creative hubs now, it's it's the vibe, right? So, and maybe answer partly your question, because um, it's really important now to see about, uh, also that relates to what uh, she was saying earlier about the mature, the ones who resist to survive or not. And I talk about the global South perspective, and I think MENA is not an exception to that. Look at it from the global South. It's really important when you want to analyze the clustering and the creative hub system birth grow and disappearance or death. It's uh, very interesting to see how much is organic and how much is the result of an inflation related to funding. Uh, because funding may bring a huge pulse in something, but if it's not rooted in the real ecosystem when the funding is over, nothing stays. And that will relate to the issue. Like it, it's really, it's uh, people always tell me, what you are in the formation professionnelle. My mind links also very important to 
analyze the situation when you analyze the mechanism of support of it. It has a huge impact on it. What tool you use financial to impulse something would impact the whole thing. And that's related to your second question. Because in the MENA region, most of the creative hubs are with international financial support. So we function in a model that it's cohorts, it's limited, we're trying, try, and then it's not that, it's not big scale, except from some countries in the Gulf. That's another ecosystem, the rather reality. So the thing is, many people will miss from the table of negotiation. Why? Because most of those uh, creative hubs, so they work with institutional funding, they work with the visibility, the, the implication, who's been involved, it's only related to the results and a deliverable of that. So who's missing from that table and discussion? Those who do well without funding. And that sends a dual and contradictive message. As long as we're saying, try do it by yourself, survive and very good, you don't depend on grant, you're doing well. Those are not invited in, the, in these arenas like this and they're not supported for mobility to speak, to be present because international uh, the, the funding and it's not a criticism, that's the system imposed on those who manage those funds that you only bring the beneficiary, the direct beneficiary of your program. Very few, I mean, if the budget allows, of course you will invite, but a lot, when we talk at the, at the local level, at country level, lots of people are missing from that table when they are not direct beneficiaries of grants. And most of the cases, these are very successful players because they work, they succeed, and they are there for years, but they are not beneficiary of grants. So I think when we talk and we map ecosystem and we try to build relationship or partnership, don't relay only because this is we all we all operate like that. Myself, I did. I had to teach myself a lot to look at that. Okay, you know, you know, evolve. You ev to evolve. How to say? You you how to say? You evolve. Sorry, you evolve. We all evolve very basically in the same circles. So, if I have an advice for yourself to go in circles where you're not used to be, if I get last last comment to that, in Africa now, a lot is happening from the, uh, there is a huge like big community that it's not with this sphere of international aid and the, not us, it's a huge, it's big, it's successful. A huge word is evolving alone and another word is evolving separately. And I think we will all gain a lot from bringing these two people together, from evolving and moving from a network to another. And that's what I do with CFW, the fact that we map and our work is to see what's happening, what is the funding and who's doing what. We, we were lucky to be in both like universe. And it's really so enriching. And it's, it's really, it brings a lot of hope, at least for my continent. When I see such successful people, such industry going on, things happening, and they are not slowed down by financial, like at least the grant side of it because there are investments and I see things are bringing. So look more into, they are supposed to be very successful, not reachable, but they are looking to be um, brought into the discussion. Yeah. Yes. What, super good point. What really surprised me in the past week, I met Ibrahim Mahama uh, who from Ghana. He's an artist from Ghana who is world renowned artist. He's selling artworks for, I think, big sums to collectors all over the world. And I was completely shocked to hear his, in his artist talk that he built a Savannah Center of Contemporary Art in Tamale in Ghana. I didn't know about this at all because it's completely DIY. He's buying plots. He's buying old airplanes that he's turning there into classrooms for children that are coming from all over Ghana, actually, to be educated in arts and so on. He's buying buildings and so on. And yeah, these things go completely under the radar and uh, it is a great pleasure to actually uh, be able to, 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 to get to know them. And sure, yes, these are the people that we need by the table. And uh, Lina, maybe uh, there is something you would like to add. Yes, perhaps I would like to, if we consider, for example, like, um, uh, like she was talking that 
Of course, some clusters do grow because of some EU structural funds or regional funds, or like I'll give an example of several clusters we have seen that have flourished, media-related clusters in the, in the core of Barcelona, like the 22 ad district in Barcelona, for example. And when we try to see why these clusters have flourished over time between 2009 and 2017, we found that there were specific, for example, investments and structural funds or Catalan funds, like the Disney Hub Barcelona, like uh, the funding for Hospital La Santa Creu, Santa Pau, uh, like uh, Barcelona Laboratory, Barcelona Art Factories, the Creative Research Park, the Institute de Cultura, the ITOCAT Foundation. So all these were governmental interventions. So policymakers have a role to play in, in supporting specific types of clusters. And there are other types of clusters which naturally flourish on their own without uh, government interventions. And of course, they need to be involved in the discussion, especially the ones related, for example, the fashion design. And mostly they are locating now in periphery areas rather than in the core and the central part of big cities, which is the case for Barcelona. Most of the, of the fashion uh, designers and manufacturers locate in the Mataro, which is a peripheral part of, of uh, not inside, it's a peripheral part of the functional urban area of Barcelona. So uh, these, these, of course, I think who need to be included in any discussion related to creative hubs and clusters are specific anchors within each cluster. This anchor can be a large enterprise. This anchor can be a um, municipality. This anchor might be a university because also in Barcelona, uh, like, for example, the R&D firms and uh, who work on medicine and who work on different uh, types of, uh, of topics, they have located now recently, they are forming hubs around the public institutions and research centers and universities. They are forming, so like in the area in San Cugat del Valles, where there's Autonomous University of, of Barcelona and this this specific um, agglomeration of research centers and universities is attracting high-tech firms locating there. So there is, for different clusters, there are specific anchors who attract other firms. Uh, they can be a university, a research center, a municipality, a independent artists, large uh, corporations or small SMEs, depending on the characteristics of the uh, creative industry and the local characteristics of each municipality. Thank you. Thank you. Since we are slowly running out of time, do we have any comments, questions for our super interesting panelists? Yes, please. Thank you very much. I would, in fact, I would have two, but uh, I will just make one. I think nobody make any question. If it's possible, we would like to make the second. Uh, the first one uh, to Salvador, um, because at the beginning of your speech, you were talking about the issue about the um, elderly people, dementia, health conditions, and so on. I have a friend that uh, who spent 15 years working for us as policy advisor for the for a party of, of group of uh, party in the European Parliament. 15 years. Uh, he's just uh, leaving this work because she realized that she wanted to do something more kind of uh, real, and she herself he's a yoga teacher, and he for as many years he was very curious and interested in, in seeing how uh, providing uh, yoga lessons to elderly people on, 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 in homes and residencias, uh, which kind of effect that could create. And basically now she's going to try to start in fact, a, a business in Brussels, well, not a business, basically a kind of NGO, whatever, providing this type of service to elderly people in, in homes. So my question is that um, apart from, from all the work uh, that uh, that uh, my my friend and yourself you were referring to with with elderly people that has already had some kind of issue, but not because elderly people is in a in a home means that they are having an issue. It's just because they are not with their families. My question is that um, um, is there any kind of initiative or is there any kind of a, uh, yeah whatever initiative try to get back to society elderly people taking into account that many of them are a, a source of knowledge that uh, we cannot gather with with any master or PhD or whatever because they have you know this piece of life and of course that 
the same as young people, uh, middle-aged people, elderly people. Some of them are um, ones that have lived a life maybe more conservative or less risk risk taken. And let's say in that sense, uh, well, they can provide uh, or share experience or, or, or teaching or, or less, more or less. But in any case, is a part of the society that for many years we're just thinking, we're using, using blah, blah, blah. we are thinking about them as a kind of, that they stop being productive and this is totally uh, false. So I was wondering about this, if, uh, if there is any kind of initiative, try to get them back somehow because there is a pension, so they are they don't have to work. I mean, to receive an income, but they some of them at least could have the choice, the chance. For example, my mother to provide service. My mother is an expert on hacienda tax issues, and she will be uh, very happy to help many people on how to do the declaration de hacienda, the tax uh, declaration, um, apart from uh, the family, the the neighbors, and the friends and friends because she would like to do so because, but nobody's asking her. So as nobody is asking her, she's taking more time uh, spending in taking care of uh, her um, grandchild. Uh, bueno, basically I should say that uh, our Occidental Western society is stupid. We are stupid as society. I let me explain myself. We want to be forever young and we just value to be young and to be extremely productive. And we have neglected the amazing knowledge and richness of the elderly people. I learned that working in Guatemala with Mayan Indian communities. I was there working with a group of Mayan Indian who had been 14 years in refugee camps. They were in the middle of the jungle. So I started talking with, with the group of elders. What do you need? I was expecting something like food, shelter and they say in our life now we walk like a dog nobody respects us we have lost our role of transfer of wisdom i was shocked enrique because they were suffering because their traditional role of transfer of wisdom the ones who were sharing the mayan culture and transferring the mayan culture to the teens and to the children has been broken so our project was so easy, it was to give them, we created the Council of Elders and they start teaching again the Mayan culture to children and to teens. And this is also happening in our society, thanks to God. Now there are so many projects. I know, for example, Conex, it's mean conocimiento y experiencia because we have wonderful people who has been working and who wants to give to society because also when we think about the moral development of the human being, when we are younger, we are more selfish. It's more about me, myself, and I. But when we get older, we want to contribute. There is this concept of uh, the Greek people who was wondering what's going to be my heritage, what I will let in this world. So how can I contribute to the well-being of society? So there are so many great initiatives linking professional knowledge, professional competence of great people the people who have been under retirement, connecting to promote social capital, social well-being. So what you are saying can be a wonderful idea. Why not to connect these people with this amazing knowledge, for example, with the kind of companies uh, that Lina was saying, these embryo cultural enterprises, for example, that really can benefit from this amazing knowledge that they have. So we don't have still enough of this uh, initiative like Conex, but every time there are more, and I think you have tackled a very, very important point. And we are less stupid now. We are realizing that we are not going to be forever young, and we realize that we cannot neglect the amazing contribution of the great of the elderly because what we have now is thanks to them. Me and myself, sorry, thank you. I just, um, back to your question because I forgot to mention. So um, it's just a call to action, this one. If um, the RMD I talked to you about, it's actually also related to what the lady was saying that the, this, these hubs can have multiple forms, could be university, et cetera. But I would like to add, it could be just a digital platform. 
uh, the RMD concept is 100% online. I told you this event will bring people together from different perspective with their supporter, funders, investor, incubator, your kind of program to meet an online over two or three days. And it democratizes access to information. It opens the door to everybody and it opens the source. For example, the last one we did in Mina, and thank you, 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 you were present uh, and the Correct for Med were present too. And uh, I saw to, um, I mean, we have like more 500 people. The one last year, I saw um, a participant. So it creates connection and the project is born between a, a cultural actor in Kuwait and a lady from Jamaica. So one year later, something is happening in between. So I think those dots or those spaces can also even digital could work for this kind of thing. So if you want to connect soon, the African one, we're doing it next year. So if you want to connect to the African connect, just keep in touch with the RMD. We will. And uh, thank you very much for all, to all the panelists and you for listening and participating. And this is the end of this panel for today. Thank you.